Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, uh, good day, good night, depending on where you are located. We are here again at ATIPI Tech Talks, a worldwide event, gathering people from all over the world in this little online space that we call our own. Uh, with me are Chantal Martin and Stephen Nixon, um, who have collaborated on a project which they will present to us. Um, Chantal is a UK-born uh, artist who now lives in Brooklyn, was it? Yes. Jersey, Jersey City. No, just, it's Stephen that's in Brooklyn, right. Okay, mm -hmm. so you're both like not Pretty too far by. from each other, yeah. Yeah. way farther than we, where we are. And um, yes, um, I must say, as a noob, I always thought that, you know, custom faces, custom fonts were things for big corporations and like the... The, 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 the broadcasting companies, but now we are going to learn all about a custom font that was made by Stephen Nixon for uh, Chantel. Um, I would say um, let's take it away and, and, and let's enjoy the presentation. Great. Thank you. And thanks so much for your help, Yuz and Carolina, um, for setting today up and Natalia and all of the rest of everyone. Um, let me pop open my screen share here. And Chantel will start us off. Cool, thank you. So there we go. So as you've said, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So happy to be here. This is something I've decided to do at kind of at the beginning of anything I do is acknowledge my younger self. So this is a little Chantel with three of my five siblings and my mum and my granddad. And this little Chantel here had no idea what the future would hold. I had no idea about art or galleries or even kind of creativity at that time. So this is just me kind of acknowledging that and acknowledging kind of the futures that we can create for ourselves that no one imagines for us. And as a little Chantel here, I would never imagine I would have created any of the work that you're about to see. So I'm an artist. I'm based in Jersey City. I've been in the New York area for about 10 years. But previously before that, I was in Japan, in Tokyo for five years. But before that, I'm from London. And some of my earliest work, like you see here now, was a little bit dark, a little bit, um, you know, kind of more line based. And this is one of my first ever characters called HM, which stood for Hangman. And HM was a robot that had a heart, but was trapped in the system that it was born into. And in many ways, I can relate that to myself. You know, sometimes we are, we don't know our potential, and we don't know what the future is, and we don't know what we can create. And we don't even know who we are as people, because we're born into spaces where we're living up to societal expectations of ourselves or projections of ourselves from other people. But fast forward, I am, as I said, I'm an artist that now has the privilege of when we could travel, go into places like this. This is Us by Night. It's a conference that took part in Antwerp in Belgium. Really fantastic conference. And there I get to kind of talk about the journey of my work. And when I look back at some of my earliest work, and you can see behind me on the stage here, there was some poem there, there was some poetry there um, that was some of my first earliest type of getting things out. Then later on, you know, there, there's other work where, you know, when I started to think about my relationship with words and type and fonts and where they came from, there was the earlier work, as you just saw, where it was more just about getting things out. And then there's projects like this where I was collaborating with my grandmother and I would send her instructions and I would say, dear grandmother, please sew me, come home, any color, any size. And she would sew that to me and send it to me wherever I lived in the world. But then I would follow up with her and say, what does come home mean to you? Or what does go home mean to you? And then we would have these cross-generational, cross-racial um, conversations based on the words that she sew, like, sewed for me in, in, in these types of projects. And so, you know, last year, 
it was, you know, well, even this year, you know, we're in the middle of a, a, a pandemic still, and it gave me time to reflect and it gave me time to think about the future and the possibilities that I wanted to create for myself and perhaps some projects that I've always wanted to do but haven't had the time or the infrastructure or the resources to do that. And so when I started to reflect and look back at my body of work, one thing that kept coming up was words and words and messages um, and this idea of making things and sharing things. And so I was like, well, I've always wanted to create a typeface. I've always wanted to take my kind of uh, handwritten font and share that with the world. I've wanted to make that and share that. And almost like a, a modern day version of uh, Comic Sans, you know, something that is easy to read for dyslexic people like myself, but it's also playful and fun and usable. And so kind of going on this mission or this journey to be like, well, I have this time now, one project I've always wanted to do that I haven't really done because it felt like there were so many hurdles in front of me and so many barriers is to create my own typeface, is to create my own font. And so I went on a little journey of finding the right partner to go down on this road with me. Someone that would understand where I was coming from. Someone that was passionate or is passionate about typography and fonts and would lend themselves to creating something that's kind of true to this vision. And so that's how I found Stephen, Arrow Type. And so today, Stephen will take you through kind of more of the practical side of creating the font and, and you know, kind of that journey of making it. But I'm so excited to, you know, give you all essentially the first sneak peek of Chantelle Sand. And, you know, I hope that this is, you know, one of my very first of many type face adventures along the road and hopefully one of many first collaborations with Stephen as well. So, you know, uh, I'm going to kind of hand it over um, to Stephen slowly there do, and, uh, and then take it from there. But, you know, I think this is an appropriate kind of uh, handoff there, right? So there we go. So, so enjoy the next few minutes. I think I'm going to learn something as well but about the making of this and I hope that you will too. So Stephen, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chantal. Um, Thanks for introducing yourself, and it's it's really cool to like hear your story in the context of those photos and everything. And I, I'm gonna re repeat just like a very high level. Um, I was really excited uh, when Chantel came to me and asked me like, "Hey, do you want to make a font together?" Um, you know, I had actually known her work already from a big mural um, that's in downtown New York City, and. Uh, as I started to look deeper into her work, I was really excited about like the huge spaces uh, she fills with some of her her murals and, and artwork and the really freeform, playful way she uses lettering um, to communicate and kind of like prom provoke thinking and sort of less of a maybe didactic way of using type or letters and more of a way to encourage other people to sort of ponder what the artwork means and maybe create their own meaning from it uh, and maybe play with letters. And as a type designer, that's something that I find really appealing um, that we can do with fonts. It's, it's really a way to take something that everyone can connect with and kind of package it in a way that makes it really um, possible to do new things uh, with these things. So, you know, I literally got a message from Chantel uh, other things were said, but the thing that really like sticks in my mind was just let's make the new Comic Sans, and I was like, wow, this is the coolest prompt ever because uh, you know a lot of people have a lot of feelings about Comic Sans. Um, it was designed in 1994 by Vincent Conair for Microsoft, and it's really a font that probably like for a lot of people it was the first time maybe as kids even, they encountered a font that was something totally different from just like something they might see in a book or something that felt really formal and uh, sort of for business purposes, but more something that like was human and encouraged play and thinking. And I feel like that's the big thing that makes this like such a smash success as a font. 
um, it's something that everybody can connect with and, uh, you know, they'll use it because it looks fun and a little different. And also, if I'm being honest, I think that it's pretty ubiquitous because it's free in the sense that basically all users already have access to Comic Sans. So if I was being practical about thinking like, well, um, you know, if, if that's actually the brief, like how do we make a new Comic Sans? Um, well, we've already got the fun part. Chantel's handwriting is a really great resource to sort of mine for letter shapes that are familiar, but just a little bit different and just like really energetic and lively. Um, but I also think that it will help um, to release it in some sort of a way that's free and freely available to people. Um, this is the kind of font that maybe like a 15 year old might reach for when they're making their first website or, or something of that sort. So we're gonna, you know, we're still in the process of figuring it all out, but this is a project that I'm really excited to release in an open source way um, to help people use it and engage with it in kind of any possible platform. Um, but then also like a lot of what I'll be talking about today uh, will eventually be available freely online um, for other people to go look at. And, and I'll say more about that as we go here. Um, so the creative process, uh, Chantel told me that she does a lot of writing with this uh, Sharpie, well, not Sharpie, but Stadler permanent marker. So we got her to write various pangrams on some paper and do numbers and symbols and some accents and some extended symbols and some, some more extended symbols and numbers. And I took these scans and I sort of started to rationalize them a little bit in Photoshop, just kind of lining up the middle points of letters and sort of pondering like how the spacing and proportions might work. And one thing I started to see was that like, there's a bit of a, a competition maybe going between the free forms of the proportions and spacing and shaping of these letters versus the goal of making something like Comic Sans that is very easy to use uh, on a computer to create a document. So first of all, you know, how do you take letter forms and, and put them into shapes? Uh, I didn't want to just throw them into like an auto tracing algorithm because that ends up creating like basically a huge impossible mess to clean up. Um, so instead here I'm in RoboFont and I'm using uh, an extension called Outliner. So that allowed me to draw sort of a center line through these scans. And then I could kind of adjust that a little bit to sort of rationalize or, or normalize it into some, some sensible, easy to use metrics and proportions. And then I could use Outliner to outline that, uh, create like a light and a bold source uh, UFO that I could then create my weight range from and, and that such uh, stuff. So a big, kind of early question here was, uh, do we kind of take the Comic Sans route, which letters are very, very monolinear and kind of end in very consistent sort of circular end caps, or do we go to the other side, this bottom one, and sort of more like accurately try to retrace the, the scans themselves and like the ink on the page of paper? And to kind of look into this question, we sort of set some text, like here's a screenshot from Chantel's website using both of these. And while I might have guessed before doing this that uh, a more accurate tracing of uh, Sharpie writing would maybe look like friendlier and more inviting, uh, I sort of realized by doing this that actually, I think it might be like specifically because of Comic Sans, but uh, when you see monolinear letter, letter forms with like very simple shaping for, for the strokes, it kind of triggers like a familiarity and the sense like, oh, this is something very approachable. So, uh, but you know, we didn't want it to just look like overly simplistic as a, as a typeface. So we kind of went a middle route, mostly monolinear, but also keeping a little bit of uh, kind of organic touch on the ends of strokes and in the letters themselves uh, so that we could kind of achieve the best of, of both worlds there. So the typeface itself, uh, after quite a lot of work and a lot of iteration, as anyone who draws type knows, uh, is now a light through extra bolds uh, kind of core of the font. 
And uh, thanks to Rutherford, who's here, by the way, for his uh, waterfall generator. That was super helpful for these. It's got an extended Latin character set, which will support a lot of languages in the Americas and Europe. And uh, thanks to Alphabet Type for their excellent character set checker. That's a very handy tool. Uh, it's got some of the nice open type features you might expect, like default tabular figures, but optional proportional figures, superiors, inferiors, fractions, case-specific punctuation, uh, kind of to engage uh, the idea of lines. Um, there's like a fun ligature feature where if you just mash the hyphen button, uh, you'll get a nice long wavy line. But the fun part about this typeface, I mean, I feel like it's, it's fun by itself, but the extra fun part uh, that maybe fits into this tech type conference is how it kind of engages the free forms of the letters. So it's a little bit uh, jumbly or a little bit free form, but ultimately the letters fit into some like relatively rigid normal uh, metrics and, and boundaries. And so the core of Chantel Sands, um, the sort of normal styles, do that as well. Uh, they don't stray too far out of those vertical boundaries. But if you look at the scans, uh, it's actually quite, quite variable how it uh, actually does fit into a vertical line there. So if you sort of draw some, some metrics, you start to notice that there are differences. So um, I think that variable fonts are a really interesting solution to a problem like this that maybe like allows us to think about it in a bit of a new way that wasn't really something that would have worked in 1994, even though variable font technology goes a long way back. Uh, it's something basically newly possible within the last few years to look at this as a typeface that's a lot less static than it might have had to be uh, in the past. So we've now got weight, bounce, and irregularity axes. And these allow really fun kind of, say, CSS animations, for instance, um, that can cycle through uh, these axes in different ways to sort of use type in a very like literally not static way to kind of be more playful and maybe sort of dance on the page. So how it's made. Um, if you've been drawing type or if you've been for the last few talks at this conference, you will already know all about interpolation. But if you're tuning in uh, without as much of an idea, that's totally fine. Uh, here's SAMHSA, which was discussed in the last talk. And this kind of shows like how an example variable font can work. So say you've got the letter A. If you draw it in a thin style and a bold style, the computer can then use a variable font to interpolate every point from sort of point A to point B. And then as a user, you could choose any part within that range, like maybe somewhere in the middle to get a regular weight. And so that's kind of the basis of a lot of variable font design today. So it gets really interesting and also really confusing when you start to think about multiple axes. So this is visualizing sort of the changes in where points are uh, as you start to apply the weight irregularity and bounce axes to this font. So you can sort of see that there's like quite a lot going on in there. And let's take a step back and look at what's happening. So written characters um, have repeating tendencies, of course. Uh, and if you look at these um, different scans, you can start to see and kind of guess at maybe some of the sort of mechanical logic behind these tendencies. So in multiple scans, I was seeing that, for instance, the W ended up being a little shorter and wider. The O ended up being a little bit small in the middle. The E ended up being a little tall often. And you can kind of, it's reasonable that like if you've got to fit more vertical strokes into a letter, like the W has to, it might end up getting to be kind of wide. Or the O is just a little point. Or the E like has to fit in more horizontal strokes, so it ends up being tall. And you can kind of uh, approximate these sort of tendencies if you've got four sources. So a font source is like a UFO, the thing you're actually drawing in um, that eventually down the road allows you to create something like a variable font. So the core styles are just light and extra bold. And then there's sources uh, organic light and organic extra bold. And so those kind of like go about as far as 
I, I thought was sensible for those kind of written tendencies. So you can see that the H is a little bit of, out of line, the E is tall, the O is small, the, the W is wide and, and a little bit shorter vertically. So then it starts to, like, you have to wonder, like, how do you get the randomization? Uh, how do you get the bounce? If, if we just did one character each of the different sizing, it would not really look like handwriting either. The thing about handwriting, and especially in Chantel's artwork, is, like, letters are a little bit all over the place, and, and that's what makes it really fun. So if you were around for Ben's talk earlier about using uh, things like font parts to manipulate font sources, UFOs, um, this is a really pretty perfect example of one way that you can do that and, and one thing that it might be useful for. It's a bit experimental, but really kind of fun, and I'll, I'll break it down a little bit. The design sources, there are four of them, uh, light, extra bold, organic light, organic extra bold, which you just saw. And those have one glyph per character, so one digital drawing of each letter. And then I run it through a Python script, and that outputs uh, eight total sources, uh, which I call the build sources in this project. And that has, for instance, three alts per, per character. Uh, it, basically just copies the normal styles, but then it does some special things to make irregular styles, and then bouncy and bouncy reversed styles. So the design sources. I've got these two normal ones. Uh, this is just the uppercase um, represented in them in RoboFont here. And you can see how the uh, organic sources are similar but different. So if I kind of flip between, you might see like the letter C is a really good example. You can see how much it changes between the normal and the irregular style. And then uh, I won't go through every line of this script, but this is uh, prepbuilds.py. It's a Python script uh, that will take those four UFO fonts and then generate the build sources. So these generated sources, there's eight of them. Here are the first four. Um, the normal ones on the left, the organic or irregular ones on the right, and all of the blue glyphs are actually kind of generated as either direct copies or with some interpolation happening right within them. And then there's these bounce sources, which take the normal glyphs, but then bounce them up and down, basically, uh, to allow some fun things in the variable font. So when you're creating a script like this, you've got to think about the logic. And then you've basically got to tell the computer every single little step to use. And, this script uses UFOs and font parts and I think font shell and a, and a few other things to manipulate fonts. So kind of a step-by-step -step thing is that it copies the sources into a new folder, sort of for safe manipulation. It then makes copies for the extra build sources, like the bouncy ones. It makes alternates for almost all of the glyphs, um, like, you know, glyph is default and then glyph.1, glyph.2, etc. It adds a positive or negative bounce to alts in the build sources and, and default glyphs in the build sources. Uh, it records those changes in the main design sources so I can repeat the build next time. Say I want to fix a letter and then rerun this build, but I don't want everything to turn out differently. Uh, so that's kind of a, a useful part of using the UFO, for instance. It interpolates the alts in the irregular sources. So not only do you have the say tall E, you've got the tall, medium, and medium, small E, and then say the regular E. Uh, it create, corrects the accent placement so that things like A grove or E acute uh, don't suddenly crash into their accents. It extends the kerning to the alternates so that kerning still is there, and then it generates the contextual alternate feature code. So that's kind of a long list. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a few of the like closer bits, but Thanks to Van Keel for kind of making examples or teaching me a lot of the things that ended up being used here. And then Tal, Eric, Eust, and so many others who have contributed to the tools that I use, uh, like the UFO and so much else. So looking a little closer, uh, each main glyph gets, as I said, three versions, actually four versions, but that's just to help like m make randomization a little better. Um, but when you've got these three versions, once you type, the computer can then evaluate what is there, and it will start with the sort of number three, 
and it goes to the number one, and then two, and then three, two, one, three, two, one. And you can kind of see, like, right down there at the bottom, it is actually, like, the second alt of A, and then it goes to the, the default of B, and then the first alt of C. And when you use this together, you can create some really fun bounce. Uh, and looking at most strings of text, you would never know uh, that it's really just a relatively simple, like, pattern of three, two, one. And it, it's mixed up a little bit better so that if you have like a repeating glyph every fourth character, it kind of accounts for that. But this is really the core of it. It's it's just an open type feature that makes a few substitutions based on where it's at within a string of text. Um, thank you, Kyle Lemming, for the open type cookbook. That really helped me figure out a lot here. Um, and how do how do we get kerning into alts. This was a problem I didn't really expect to have. I should have expected it, um, but you know, it was one of those things that you get halfway through a build and you're like, all right, I'm done with that. That was easy. And then you think, oh, oops, no, there's something I totally didn't account for. So I add kerning in metrics machine where, you know, kerning, first of all, if, if you're not super familiar with type, is the exceptions to the general spacing in glyphs. So, you know, an A has general side bearings um, to set within text, but then if you've got a combination like AV, you probably want to tuck that in a little bit to make your spacing look more rhythmic and predictable in text so you don't have like really big gaps in the middle of words or places where characters crash together. So if the top row is what I want and what I'm trying to design in the design sources, once I added those alternates, I was getting the bottom. And it, this may not look super different, but uh, like there are some pretty unsightly gaps there. And that's because that three, two, one thing is happening. So even though I'm kerning A and V together, I'm not kerning A alt one and V alt two or A alt two and, and V default. So this was kind of a problem. But luckily uh, there was a solution here. Uh, kerning groups have similar sides. So this is like a well-known concept within kerning. And that's because like you have a lot of characters which are a base letter, but then with accents added. And that allows for efficient kerning. So if you've kerned the T and A and then the A and T, you can, if you've got a group set up, the A acute and A grave and all of these other A's will also be kerned against the letter T. So basically part of it is manual and then part of it is helpfully like somewhat automated uh, by the build system. So then this was possible to extend in the generated alts in that font part script. I was just able to say, like, if, if you've come from a group, then you can kind of be put back into that parent group. And then this allowed kerning to work with this 3, 1, 2 um, pattern where kerning was kind of reapplied to these, these pairs. And this font works. Uh, <laughs> it's a really fun thing to use. Like, um, I... There's certainly probably something else out there that does this, but it's really nice to be able to like, like not only have a bouncy baseline, but also be able to control that kind of up and down. And that can kind of create some interesting cyclical animations. So it's also a set of static fonts. Um, I find that so far in desktop publishing, um, or even something like uh, Keynote, say, which I've made this slide deck in, um, you kind of need static fonts for variable fonts. So that's kind of useful. It forces you to think about this in sort of two systematic ways. So it's got the normal family, which is, I guess if I had to say like something was going to be the new Comic Sans, like that's the intent of the normal family. But then there's the irregular, uh, which randomizes through some of those irregularities. There's the semi-bouncy, which turns on a little bit of bounce, bouncy, and then combinations of those two. Um, so, We've put it to use in a few places. Uh, Chantel um, had or probably still has a show up at the New Britain Museum of American Art. So they used an earlier version of Chantel Sands uh, for part of that logo type. And she's got a collection at the Whitney shop. Um, so various key tags created these really cool key tags um, with sort of short affirmational phrases by uh, Chantel. Um, and these are kind of like to promote creativity, I would say. Um, so they're available there. And we've also created like a little bit of an experimental type specimen uh, where 
you can go to this too if, if you want. It's just chantel sansarotypecom And you can kind of like click around on the screen and cycle through these uh, sort of, I would call them poems. I don't know if they, they are poems, but uh, they'll kind of come on the screen and then, and then fade away as you click through them. So it's, it's a bit like, uh, like a game, uh, which is kind of an interesting way to play with type. And it's just like one very small way that uh, I'm trying to hint that we could maybe think about type in, in different ways than we tend to. So again, there's the URL. Um, it's coming soon to a screen near you. And I uh, can't wait to figure that out. Uh, so thank you so much for coming. Thanks again to the ATIPI folks and uh, to the many people who kind of created so much of the foundational technology that allows us to do fun projects like this. And of course, thanks to the Chantel uh, for working with me on this uh, experimental and, and really fun project. So yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you, Stephen. And I just want to say, you know, it was so nice to watch that as, uh, as an artist that is a huge fan of the process and versus kind of the result sometimes. It's so nice to see you take us through the whole process of that. And then also, I'm a huge fan of people who are obviously obsessed with their path or their career. And so it's obviously, you know, that you are as obsessed with what you're doing as I am. And so, you know, it's so nice to collaborate with you in that way. Uh, yeah, and then at the same you. time, it's, it's, it's so nice to collaborate with actually, you know, we are collaborating, but we are also collaborating with everyone else who's creating these incredible tools out there that have allowed us to do this. So, you know, I just want to thank you personally, Stephen, for uh, taking us through that in, in such a, you know, really fun way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Right, thank both of you. It's uh, wonderful to see two uh, passionate and, and talented artists come together in this project. So it's a, a lovely marriage of art and technology to, to make something uh, truly unique. Um, there's very little, uh, very little questions, I must say. Very few questions. Uh, I'm looking through the chat, but um, the only thing I saw was Philip Blazek, uh, who rightly so... Uh, had some um, criticism on the specific shape of the Karen accent, accent. so mm, maybe okay. they should get in touch just yeah, to look start. it out and see what if there is something specific that needs to be um, uh, amended for for the specific accent. Um, other than that, I don't see anything else popping up. I must say it was very usually when a when a presentation is done, I always say, "Oh, I could ask this." Because it's very very complete and, and very well explained so I'm, I'm a bit at a loss here about making up questions and, and, and so on. I don't know if anybody else hold on there is now a question here. Ah yeah, ah, Carolyn Porter. Um, uh, hi Carolyn. She was wondering what the timeline was uh, for this project uh, from, from concept and development and so can you give a little more explanation yeah. about that? So um, I you know, I was thinking about, I've been thinking about this for many years, and then I have no idea when I reached out to Stephen, I, I forgot. You know, time in the last year doesn't make any sense. So I believe maybe it was June that I reached out to you initially. Is that completely wrong? I think it was June or July, yeah. Yeah, so I reached out to Stephen around June or July, and, you know, this is kind of where we are now. And so, you know, right now we're just trying to figure out um, the best way to release this. You know, uh, I want to release this as an OFL. Um, but I also want to release it in a way where it can have some impact and visibility so it kind of gets as much use uh, as, you know, as work has gone into it. So, um, you know, and that's the thing with, you know, the, I guess independent projects that you're directing yourself is that you're not, um, you're not driven by any kind of external deadlines in a way. So, um, you know, trying to figure out just the best way to tie it in and, and pull it out there in the world. Yeah, well said. And and then development of of the fund itself, Stephen. Uh, can you break it down, like roughly, about how long it took? Um, I have been doing time tracking for the last year, or so I don't know. It it took uh, like every font maybe longer than uh, <laughs> I thought it would. Um, I was like, yeah, we'll just make the core styles, uh, throw it through some Python, and Bing, Bang, Boom. Like we'll have this like incredible quantum uh, work of art, uh, and the bing bang boom takes a while to like actually code out uh, but yeah it's it's like ready to actually use and which is a really great feeling i'm sure there are things like the caron that like can definitely be improved so you know i i really like the ability to set up something like that with 
GitHub issues and things so that users can come back and actually tell me like what things maybe uh, can be improved upon. Uh, yeah. It's a really great learning mechanism. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great point. You know, with things like this, you know, any feedback for things that, you know, feel wrong or like, you know, user, you know, I think people, we never really know how people are going to use these fonts. So I'm sure there's things that don't work that we haven't even imagined, but um, it, it's nice to kind of hear those. And I think from both sides here, um, you know, we've learned a lot and uh, along this way. And um, so I'm so excited, you know, we're kind of at that point where we're, we're ready to pull it out in the world and, and also hopefully encourage more artists to do the same, you know, to collaborate with, with uh, typographers out there or foundries and, and, you know, put these new typefaces out there in the world. Yeah, Actually, I do have a question uh, for uh, Chantal. Um, oh, Karina, do you want to say something? Yeah, no, I just uh, said that there were coming up questions here in the Q&As, but uh, yeah, we have yes. a question for uh, Paul van der Lans. Did you ever consider randomizing the spacing? I think that's a question for you, Stephen. Yeah, that, that is a good question. Um, the spacing is a little bit randomized in the irregular axes. Uh, the, uh, it kind of goes along with the letter proportions. Um, it's a little bit corrected, but like a little bit intentionally not corrected. And, um, you know, I think that kind of goes along with it uh, as something that's like encouraging people to look at type in a bit of a different way than I might on like a really like perfectionist sort of, uh, I don't know, text typeface or something. Um, as far as like actually having a variable slider for spacing, I've heard that um, as an interesting sort of thought, and um, that could be interesting. Like, there's there's funny technical things. Like, some web browsers will sort of turn off certain open type features uh, if you add spacing to lettering. And of course, Chantel's artwork does have extra spacing, so it then becomes kind of a question like how much file size does it add to the variable font like that kind of plays in my head um, and what are the trade-offs around like adding extra sources and deltas to a project uh, to do something like a spacing axis um, and then is it worth it I don't know it's probably a future experiment I should I should do out uh, with the build prep it like wouldn't be too hard is like famous last words of a uh, coder uh, but I think it wouldn't be too hard so it might be good there's a question from Lauren Spenny who asked how the project was funded. Yeah, uh, it was funded with my own money, basically. Um, so as I said, it's like an independent project that I wanted to do for a long time. So in a way, I decided to invest that in this project. And then uh, Sonia Knecht uh, is asking, was it difficult for you to give away and let someone else rework your original letters, this is especially for Chantal? Because handwriting is something very per personal. Yeah, you know, I think there's a really good question. You know, I think on on two different fronts. Um, you know, potentially I could walk down the street next year or next month and see, you know, what is perhaps based on my handwriting on a billboard or something like that. Once you put it mm -hmm. out there. On the other hand, um, I think there's there's nice legacy in, involved with within type. Um, and so even though something is quite personal, it's based on my handwriting, it isn't my handwriting, but as an artist, you know, I think what's carried within the message or the intention of the work is really valuable and meaningful and positive. And so what I'm actually giving away in a sense or what I'm actually sharing or being open with is the intention and the positivity and the creativity that is embedded within Chantel Sands. And so with that kind of intention or with that kind of thinking, I think you can only gain in this type of project when you hand over your handwriting for someone to collaborate with to turn into a font. And when you hand over your handwriting in a way for someone to use in any kind of project that they want to. So I think there is an openness and an intention there that um, I would like to see within the legacy of, of a font or a typeface in, in this instance. And uh, it's um, a handwriting font, you have to uh, write these sentences to give 
to have every single character. So the the writing becomes something uh, more mechanical. So it's like as if you're getting one step removed from your personal handwriting. Did it teach you something about your own handwriting, having to write the specific letters, the specific sequences for uh, Stephen to be able to work with? with? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, one of the first things Stephen said is, you know, like, write these things out, but do it on a straight line. And then I realized that I don't really write ever on straight lines. So even that was a challenge or felt very unnatural within itself. And so when I was writing on these straight lines, I realized that a lot of my, you know, as we saw, a lot of my letters don't actually touch the lines or they go over the lines. And so (laughs) it was kind of nice to see these, not inconsistencies, but maybe like characteristics of the work um, that... I think as we just kind of automatically write, we are unaware of. So I think it's a really nice exercise for someone that, you know, isn't kind of consumed within this world of typography to actually sit down with my own handwriting and go through that mechanical practice or mechanical activity and see myself within that handwriting on the page. Um, And I think, you know, perhaps outside of this industry, we don't do that at all. So when we do do it, I think we get closer to a little bit of ourselves and our handwriting, which was a really nice exercise. We have one more question from Barry uh, Bododicki uh, to Chantel. How do you anticipate using the typeface in your professional practice? So many, so many uh, possibilities. As you just saw, um, you know, I've already used them in in the keychains. Um, you know. There is, uh, I've been working on writing a manifesto for the future of art. And as a document, I would love to print that in Chantal Sands. You know, I would love to see it in the title cards of any uh, videos or uh, movies I might make. Um, I'd love to see it in print. I'd love to see it in T-shirts. I'd love to um, see it experimented with and see where it can Mm. go. So I, I would say the short answer to that question is that I'm excited to see it everywhere and anywhere and in places I never expected it. I have a question also. It's not in the chat. It's my personal question because I'm very interested in your project. I was thinking about the things that I see behind you uh, that I think that you have made, but when I look at your work, there are so many uh, symbols or um, uh, ornament parts and, and uh, you know, small pictograms. Would you ever consider to have that in your typeface? Yeah, totally. Why not, right? <laughs> like a heart, um, or, you know? Yeah, yeah, you know, there's eyes, there's hearts, there's, you know, and, and it's funny just looking at the, some of the different types of aids um, in, in the presentation. I was like, oh, like, they actually look like stick figures, and I wonder what would happen if you leaned into that and make some of these, um, you know, characters actually stick figures, or actually mm-hmm. like a sun, or actually a bird, or actually mm-hmm. some of these, um, you know, because I feel like words and lines are the same thing. You know, in a way, words are made up of lines, and my drawing is also made up of lines. And so, what if some of that language that is in my drawing could quite literally? be some of the characters of the words or you know the the typeface itself so um i think definitely you know maybe on our next project uh (laughs) you know i'll start saving again and and, you know work on my my next type font and uh perhaps incorporate that too that would be very very nice there's a last question from Rodrigo Sayani, which may solve your funding issue, um, who asks, have you given thought about NFT, this being a digital artist collaboration? Um, I'd like maybe expand on that more at some point, come find me. But, you know, NFTs is a whole different conference. But, um, you know, I've, I've definitely started to explore on some different collaborations with the NFT space. And, uh you know, be curious to see how that could work here. You know, maybe uh, maybe me and Stephen will make some NFTs based on Chantal Sam's. We'll see. But uh, we'll, we'll let you know. Keep an eye on this space. <laughs> I think we covered everything. So I want to thank you again for this presentation. It's a, it's a lovely pro project. Really interesting to see it uh, take shape and, and the end result. Um, we can continue the discussion if people wish to do so in the Hangout room. So um, I would all invite you. Thank you again, Chantal, Stephen, and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.